On behalf of everyone at Expo Chicago, welcome to Dialogues, our series of panels discussions, provocative artistic discourse, and discussions with leading artists, curators, designers, and arts professionals on the current issues that engage them. The program is presented in partnership with the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. My name is Stephanie Cristello. I'm the programming manager here at Expo Chicago. I'm also the editor-in-chief for The Scene, Chicago's International Journal of Contemporary and Modern Art. The Dialogues program will be running continuously until tomorrow, and we hope that you can join us at one of the many discussions we have upcoming. It is my distinct pleasure to present our first panel for today, entitled Photography is Magic, presented in partnership with the Aperture Foundation. The panel will be moderated by Charlotte Cotton, an independent curator and author. She has held positions including the head of the WADIS at Annenberg Photography Department at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, head of programming at the Photographer's Gallery in London, creative director at the National Media Museum in the United Kingdom, and curator of photography at the Victoria Albert Museum in London. We are very pleased to welcome Charlotte, who will now introduce our panelists, artists John Houck, Matt Lips, Philip Meisel, and Kate Staisu. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, thank you to Expo for including us in your dialogue session. What a lovely space to have a conversation. It's really nice and intimate. Um, we're going to have a conversation for about 45 minutes and then open up to your observations and questions. And then at 12.30, we're going to move to the Aperture Foundation booth, which is number 112. So it's just down the left-hand side of the space. Um, where we will hopefully continue the discussion with you and sign the very beautiful Photography is Magic. Um, I wanted to give a little introduction to everyone and um, Kate Stesu is of enormous importance to the conception and the form of Photography is Magic for me. I mean, I assume many of you know her work since the late 2000s, which has been one of... Um, one of the kind of major articulations of creating and materialising this dynamic image environment. Um, Kate and I have an ongoing conversation which definitely pushed some of the ideas that I propose within Photography is Magic and she is also the creator of the image for the gatefold um, of the book. Um, John Hauck has been very important to me again in terms of the conversation that we have and his very beautiful writing, but of course his very impressive bodies of work. Um, I think at a time when everything photographic is still at play, every gesture from a very handcrafted analog approach to the algorithmic, John's layering of all of these active choices is a really supreme articulation of where we are right now. I met Phil Maisel um, in uh, San Francisco when we were both teaching at CCA. And what I think drew me to Phil's work was the way in which his process is very explicitly iterative. And what I mean by that is that uh, the meaning of a piece, the reading of a piece, is highly contingent in what he makes before and after and around a piece. And this idea that photographic practice is not bound up so much in the idea of the tableau, which was one of our kind of major kind of uh, uh, concentrations in the 2000s, but um, is a much more iterative process, that there's, there's a closeness with the process of the artist. Um, and Matt Lips produces exquisite work, which I'm sure you all know. And he draws from I suppose really the sort of analog traditions of artist collage and scrapbooks, but I think there's also the teenager in the bedroom about Matt's work mm -hmm. and the idea of corralling and finding images and finding connections and drawing from a world much wider than your actual environment. In a practical sense, what Matt does is he selects images and then very carefully scalpels them out and then he creates relationships, physical, stage-like relationships between images, which are then uh, they're held within the photograph. And it's this amazing sense of a constellation of meaning between images, reflecting, of course, the way in which images behave and we corral images in light of Web 2.0. 
So one of the points that I try to make in the essay for Photography is Magic is that um, this is a very creative moment within image making. And specifically, I see it very much as an artist-led movement. So rather than being a sort of the tail end of the institutional definition of photography as a cultural subject, which begins in the 1970s, for me, and I think really the optimism of the book is saying, actually, institutions might be going through a worrying time of not knowing where to place their photographic collections or photographic narratives within its structures and the story of modern and contemporary art. But actually, everything is fine when you look at it from an artist-led point of view. And one of the reasons that I think it is such an animated moment is um, just when photography was being established as a cultural subject in the 1970s principally, so you saw the founding of photo departments within museums and uh, single issue based spaces dedicated photo to photography, there wasn't this pre-existing thing called photography as a cultural subject. And so you had to come from lots of different directions. It was an incredibly open discussion about what this subject should be. And I would say that in light of Web 2.0, we're at another amazing juncture where our image environment, the media environment in which images operate, get used, but also behave quite independently of our curatorial and artistic practices, creates another moment that needs cultural definition. And as a result, I think we're seeing another time where you don't necessarily have to come through a very limited educational trajectory to this particular moment. So I wanted to start by asking you like, where you've come from into this particular exciting moment of image culture. Yeah, you start, Kate. Okay, I'll start. Let's go down the line. Um, yeah, it's interesting, and um, we were talking a little bit about this last night. Um, I went to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago here um, and graduated in 2002, which was a moment where we, we were still using wet dark rooms, and um, you know there was a slide library, there was an internet, but we were certainly weren't using it to look at um, art the way that we do now. Um, so, um, but at the same time, I witnessed September 11th here, which was really interesting because that I experienced on the web. So that to me was like a real um, transitional moment where, you know, I was looking at art in, in physical form and creating art uh, in the dark room, but experiencing culture more and more on, on the net. Um, and um, so after school, uh, I, I needed to get a job and I ended up finding because I had learned Photoshop here, uh, finding a job retouching, and that was kind of where I came in contact with the, the tools and um, you know, processes of post-production, and um, sort of by default, by not having enough money or access to dark rooms anymore, was suddenly in this world where I was working on other people's images, um, editing images you know, for both um, commercial and, and uh, art practices, and um, yeah, and that became really, Kind of formative in my my you know transition from thinking about making photography per se or capturing images to the kind of labor and um, tools used to produce images yeah. in the larger cultural context um, and you know from there kind of thinking about what um, you know what what was the creative potential in these tools? Is there a creative potential and an artistic potential in these tools that are used to enhance or edit, but otherwise are kind of hidden from, yeah. from the production process? I mean, there's, I mean, there's a story about Photoshop within your, your individual journey, right? That Definitely. sort of like early 2000s, Photoshop, I guess, within the art school was really just a simulation of wet darkroom yeah, techniques. Digital darkroom, yeah. Yeah, like a digital darkroom. Yeah. And then at the point in the mid-2000s when you're working in really the high end, I mean, Photoshop isn't what we have now. It was right. almost like this secret society yeah, of very, definitely. very few people who had those skills. Yeah, and it was like, a, you know, in, in that way, it was a series of, of, of peculiar moments. At one hand, the transition between the digital and uh, between the analog and the digital in school, and then also this moment before a lot of photographers and image makers across the board were in charge of their own post-production, and this, you know, you relied on post-production houses to, um, you know, for pre-press, for exhibition preparation, for whatever. And um, so again, it was another highly peculiar moment yeah. where Photoshop wasn't necessarily something that everybody had. It was super expensive. It was, you know, yeah. it, 
designated to the realm of education and or professional use entirely. So. And how does, how does it get to a position where you're starting thinking of that as a material and a modality within your own practice rather than the way that you earn a living? Yeah, it was. I mean, I think it was. It was. Uh, it was based in play, really. Like I, I, um, I worked in a retouching studio that was um, kind of populated by other art kids like me. We were all poor. We worked too too many hours, and you know, and we would. And we, that was also my first introduction to chat, like uh, eye chat. So we would take these images, other people's images, and I won't name names because that's like entirely blasphemous. But we would, you know. <laughs> Uh, cut and paste and make weird compositions and shoot them back and forth to each other, layering on top of each other's work. And um, and I thought, you know, I started to think, well, there's something really interesting to this play. It's more yes. than play. It's more. It's like taking a, you know, the creative agency away from the the capture of the image per se, and yes. and um, you know, really feeling a sense of ownership over what happens to it after uh, it's in our hands. So that that got me thinking about. Um, you know, how far can this go? Yeah. Um, and, and does it have a cultural resonance outside of its use value? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna jump around so you don't feel like you're just waiting in a queue. Matt, tell us about your beginnings. Oh, um, I, in my bedroom when I was like 13, as you mentioned, um, <laughs> that was my introduction to photography and this sort of the way I was seduced into the imagery of glamorous pictures, beautiful women. I was like super obsessed with supermodels of the 90s. Um, I was collecting all these images thinking that I could be maybe Irving Penn like as a day job, but I still wanted to be an artist, so I wanted to be able to photograph like Ansel Adams. So I started I, you know, started black and white photography in high school and then went into an undergrad program that was very straightforward craft only chemical 35 millimeter black and white film. Um, roaming around on the streets with my camera, taking pictures of hubcaps in my shoes, which is interesting because I, I teach now, so like 30 years later, like my students are still doing this. It's like one of those things you do when your first roll of <laughs> film is take pictures of your feet. But um, so it was very much so a deeply analog past and, uh, or start. And then I also worked in a photo lab. So I was being trained in Photoshop, and this was like Photoshop 3.0, 2.0, like the very earliest Photoshop there was almost. Um, and, and being kept current on like the cutting edge of what that technology was, but it was never my fine art practice, that was my day job, so there was sort of a split right there. Yeah. And I think it wasn't until I got into graduate school um, and really started get deeply engaging in like theoretical sort of relationships that people have to images and the impact um, that they have on me and uh, as us, you know, us in a culture, a visual culture, that are read these images and share histories, um, that I think all of these things sort of came together. So yeah. I still have a very deeply analog, tactile, hand-cutting process. For the most part, it's me listening to terrible music in my studio, cutting out pictures and trying to figure out how they work, but then sort of another critical lens that's brought to it later to see what the, the what the juxtapositions might mean, what they mean to me, and then to share them with other people to see what other people find in them. Yeah. So that it does link up to uh, more of like a, a, di a current digital conversation about like sort of rhizomatic structures of image information or even Google image search, the way like all of these things pop up at once that signal all these different things. Yes, So that's great. Phil, um, I forgot to mention in the introduction, actually, that some of your lovely new work is on show just next door at Document. Um, how did you get to that? What's your journey been? Well, uh, I kind of came to photography l late in a way. Um, I did an undergrad in um, psychology and then worked um, a pretty random job doing property assessments. <laughs> um, and I just started taking photography classes at night, um, and that's kind of where I started to build upon my work. What, what, what do you think you were doing by taking photography night classes? What would that have oh. meant to you at that time? Yeah, no, it, was just, it was just a hobby. It was really affordable. It was a community college, so, um, it, you know, it was just something to do outside of this kind of mind-numbing day job I had. Yeah. Um, and so I kind of came to photography through a very almost technical background, um, just because it was this community college and it was all about kind of jobs and, and um, yeah, retouching and, and kind of fashion or, or editorial or um, documentary. And so uh, my relationship to photography was, was that at first. Um, but I always kind of felt uh, not at ease with that at all, just because 
Well, one, I didn't think I was a, actually a great photographer to begin with, and then so um, to try to shoot something on the, on the fly like that never really worked for me. Um, and so I feel like my relationship to photography has always been, um, I guess, like a, a push and pull where I love it and then it, I feel completely um, unfit for it and then I obsess <laughs> about it, but um, I also kind of have a distance to it. Um, yeah. 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 So, yeah, I feel like it wasn't until um, grad school that it kind of opened up in a, in a certain way and I was able to kind of think about it in a broader conversation. I mean, I think that distance that you describe is very indicative of this moment and this idea that people are coming from lots of different places. That there is, I mean, it's not a sort of lack of attention to what you're doing, but there is mm -hmm. a distance to that very basic premise of photography being my voice or the camera being a prosthetic. Like, it's a, it's a different relationship, I think, with photographic technology. And I guess, I guess for you too, John, right? Yeah, I also came to uh, photography a bit a bit late in the game, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I uh, I studied architecture in college, and then worked in software uh, and also computer science. And I worked in software for five years at uh, Sun Microsystems. And to put it to put it rather bluntly, I suppose I became I felt quite lonely being on the computer all day, programming twelve hours and. As much as I enjoyed that as a kind of intellectual pursuit, the social aspect was completely sort of lacking. So I thought, yeah. why not go back to school for architecture? I had this undergrad in it. So I went to UCLA for architecture originally. And pretty soon into the first year, I realized that was also not exactly what I wanted to do and that architecture was a way to please the world and my parents so that I could have this great major that was respectable and, uh, you know, combine my interest in engineering and art and all of these things. And really, uh, you know, moving to LA, starting to see, like I saw the Tim, so Tim Hawkinson show at LACMA, and that just changed my entire perspective. And I thought, what am I wasting my time for? Why not cut to the chase and become an artist? So that summer I was working for Tom Main, the architect, and he had a show at the Pompidou in Paris. And there was a show of LA artists next door to his, his architecture show, and I met Jim Welling or sort of badgered Jim Welling to um, <laughs> let me take his undergrad photo class as a graduate. And I then transferred and cobbled together an MFA uh, at UCLA and worked with a, a wide range of people. Um, Casey Reese, who developed his own programming language, Jim Welling, Andrea Frazier. And, and that's when I really, it was in grad school when I started working with Welling that I really in earnest began uh, photographic practice. Um, and it, for me, it really wasn't until the Whitney program in New York that I uh, found my own voice in a sense. I think up until that point I idealized what an artist was and was trying to attain some kind of ideal notion of an artist when the Whitney taught me to really look at my biography and integrate architecture, software, all these things that I thought weren't art that needed to be sort of cleaved off from my experience. Yeah. Uh, in that program they suddenly became a part of my process and that's when it really took off in a sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's an interesting point that you make about this idea of like what it means to be an artist. And definitely one of the proposals within Photography is Magic is that um, I talk about like the historical precedents for you all, because there's been probably one of the most used kind of analogies for the work that you're doing is like contemporary cubists, right? So it's having a very strong relationship with the avant-garde. And I, I, I get it to a certain point, particularly when you're talking about the cubist collages and this sort of layering within one frame, um, which obviously has a very kind of, um, kind of a different read within a screen-based era. But I think there is a massive difference, whereas with the cubists, you might say, well, they were, had an avant-garde mo moment, and they drew in from this image explosion, their version in the early 20th century of the image explosion. They were drawing all of this material into the dialogue of avant-garde practice. So still a very stable idea of what it is to be an artist, which I guess is one of those kind of fantasies that artists, that gets you to that point of making the commitment to being an artist. But then that actually not being a reality or a particularly interesting position, a fixed position to adopt, I think, within the current image environment. 
So, I mean, there's a lot of writing around this, of course, because I'm talking about post-internet practice and this idea of having multiple positions, being both articulating ideas around the image world, of the image world, but also being within the image world. So these quite mobile positions within it. And I wondered if that resonates with any of you at all. And I don't, I'm not going to call you out. It's up to you to, to chime in if that resonates. Yeah, I would just, yeah. Uh, I would say something that, that sort of struck me last night that we were talking about in relation to that is this idea that the post-internet or the iterative or this kind of feedback loop that we, I think we all partake in as photographers where we're continually sort of making something and then folding it back into the process of making. Uh, I think there's something really profound in terms of a search for contingency in that. And yes. I think... I think Photoshop, for me at least, it it uh, it kind of levels out that contingency, and I and that's where the physical comes in. That's why I actually make kind of maquettes to photograph to then lay out objects back on top of that, and it the the, the physical paired with the the kind of repetition of the digital creates this this strange disjunction that I think is maybe a search for the lost magic of the chemical index of photography perhaps, or some way to find desire within the highly repetitive kind of drive of the digital. There, I mean, there are a lot of reasons why one would do that, but I think, yeah, it's of course, as you're pointing out, very different from the cubist model of the avant-garde. Um, yeah. I think we're all after something different. I mean, what do, you, what do you think Photoshop does? What does it, I mean, this leveling out? I think that, for me, um, I think Photoshop, one thing I was just gonna jump on with- No, with you go what, ahead, what, sorry. What John was saying is that um, I think, the one thing that I relate to that's sort of a, a, you know, an aside to the, the Cubist comparison is, is I think there's like a reconciliation with a pace change in the way that we mm. receive and also produce cultural information. And I think that there's a similarity there um, in, in the way that you know, people are, artists are trying to, and you know, humans in general are trying to reconcile themselves to a new pace. And, um, yeah, in that way, I think that um, you know Photoshop certainly plays a role in in both the, the the pace of the the production and the dissemination of that. And then there's like, you know, to to sort of connect with what John was saying. There's then then there's this moment where you have to real, you have to sort of rein it back in and figure out how to um, physicalize that or or yeah. in a way that resonates. How would you describe the pace of your own practice? I mean, and there's a number of steps within yeah. it, isn't there? Yeah, it's sort of, it's like slow, fast, slow, fast, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, and, you know, the, the, the hoarding of images, the collecting of images and all of that is actually very slow and methodical. And I think that, that you know, you guys can all relate to that too. That, that probably everybody in this room can relate to this, <laughs> like, collecting that, that has now become part of our... Um, experience of photography, whether it's yeah. our own image archives or the things that we like from the web, this constant sort of um, hoarding. And, uh, and but the actual um, construction of the pieces, it, the, the element that happens in Photoshop is very fast. Um, I like to keep that close to an instinctual level. Yeah. Um, so not to, I don't like to over worry that <laughs> that aspect. Um, one of the one of the things that I think, I mean, for me, Photoshop has done a number of amazing things. The first one is the idea that you can manipulate and change a, an area of an image without any material effect on anything else. So there's a well that that has consequences, I think, in terms of the process. Um, and the other thing, of course, is, is, is that Photoshop is a kind of um, a ritualized, a sort of symbolic version of the painterly, the photographic, and to a certain degree, the sculptural as well. Um, which leads me on to another kind of point within photography is magic, where, and I'm quite careful in my language, I sort of trip myself up when I use the word photography, because I've got very cautious in using that world, word, because it has this cultural baggage that by saying photography, you're talking about a defined subject. So I've moved on to a stage where I feel much more comfortable in talking about the photographic alongside the sculptural and painterly. And within that, the idea that current generation of artists 
if they do define themselves or caricature themselves as a photographer, there's something quite distanced about that. It isn't like a lifelong commitment to a single discipline. So I wondered what, what, whether the idea of, do you feel you have a relationship with photography or do you feel you have a relationship with the photographic or, or both? I, I definitely have a relationship to both. I, in my practice, I, um, which is very slow, <laughs> painstakingly slow, hand cutting all these things out um, and getting them to stand up and fig resolving compositions. And um, I, I often like think that I'm going to make a sculpture at some point, like maybe this is done, but I never necessarily feel like I can reconcile, reconcile a relationship to ex explaining it or talking about it and because I know that I'm building it as an image. I know that, yeah. that I understand and feel comfortable about how it operates when it's locked under the veneer of the photographic emulsion blown up to a certain size and then, then I understand how it works. So I, but I pass through a sculptural moment to get there but I, I kind of, I oscillate back and forth and I, and I think that there is something very sculptural about the photographs but they are always going, or they have always been sort of flat and sort of in the sort of frame but yeah, I mean, I think I think your work has it both ways. Like, it's very definite. It's definitely a photograph. It's definitely photography, but actually, it's the photographic and that sort of mobility of it. And people come into the studio all the time, and it's like there'll be you know, 500, 600 cutouts on this wall, and they'll look at them and they want to play with them and touch them. It's very tactile. And it's like the photographs behind you. <laughs> it's on the <laughs> other wall. <laughs> but so not there yet, but. Definitely pass through. No, I, mean, I can relate to that kind of tactile um, allure of of just those kind of those sculptural elements. I mean, uh, I feel like my work um, definitely plays with the notion of the photograph when I um, collage elements on top of it or kind of cut into it, and it kind of rests between collage and and, and a photograph. Um, um, I have in the past also made kind of sculptural installations yeah, as yeah. Um, as part of a, an exhibition, um, and that feels like something that is ready to be photographed or kind of functions, um, you know, from standing at a at a specific vantage point as one of my images. Yeah, so very photographic sculptures yeah. essentially. Yeah, I think too. Um, it, it's interesting the shine away from the the photographic or the, the inherently photo-based language because yeah. on the other hand, I, I sort of vacillate back and forth just conceptually and, you know, my own experience of it because uh, whether, you know, this is like the perfect example of fair is that we've, mostly I experience fairs via images of artwork, right. whether, whether they're sculptures or paintings or whatever. So the, the in some ways, it's like, our experience of art and life in general has become more photographic than ever. And yes. um, in that way, I think a lot of practice is like a photographically derivative, whether it's in that iterative, iterative or, you know, um, potentially like reproducible way that you described earlier, or just in the way that, that we, you know, experience it, you know, on a screen or uh, in, you know, in some inherently photographic capacity. Yeah. Yeah, I would. Um I guess I feel like photography is almost in a, inescapable in a sense in that no matter what I make going forward, it will be photographic to some degree. It's like, uh, I guess, as everybody was speaking, I was kind of reminded of this, this Kaja Silverman idea that, that photography is the second coming in some way, and it's the only one that will occur. T it, t tell us more it's, about It's that. a kind of presencing of the world, uh, you know, that, that started very early on, of course, and has a long history, but it, uh, it shows us the world in a way that, you know, religion could or something. Um, <laughs> and, and her idea is that this is, this is it, that it's already arrived, and how do we work through it in a sense? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I like to think of, um, you know, one of, one of the contexts that I've worked is in a science museum and thinking around the um, imaging within the history of science, which um, and the proto photographic, and I like to think that this sort of kind of the the history of photography, which begins in the early 19th century, and I think maybe we should we should stop at around 2004. But that history is a chapter in a story of human endeavor, which is all about visualizing, mapping, and prototyping. 
ideas. And that, that also seems to have um, a connection with um, the idea of experimentation. Like I would relate what's going on in contemporary practice more to an almost modeling prototyping version of experimentation rather than directly through the avant-garde idea of experimentation. Which, um, uh, well, anyway, I would love to ask you about like what you think your frame of reference is for those acts of experimentation, whether they're driven s exclusively by art and uh, particularly conceptual art practice, or whether it's much more broader, much more broad than that for you. I, I mean, for me, it's much more broad. I think, um, if I'm understanding the question, no, I was, I was thinking, rambling. So you just day, <laughs> pick a bit. <laughs> what it made me think of was I, when I said last night that like. I, I can't think outside of language. If I'm trying to explain something to myself in my head, I need to do it through language in order to articulate it to myself. I feel the same way about images. In the, like, I imagine most of my activities as an image before either before they happen or what I think they look like when they did happen. Yesterday, I had to come by this room to look at this room so I could imagine myself in the room to make sure that I wouldn't die in this room or something. <laughs> so I'm doing okay, I guess. But, um, but I mean, and even like, when, when having a birthday party or that vacation you have, like th there is these images, whether they're selfies or landscape pictures, sunset images you're hoping to have so that you can have these memories. After the event, you'll have this record of like, that great time that you had. And all of this is now this material that you draw on. And, I mean, for me, and, I, and mm. a lot of times I am looking, I'm looking at other artists, what other people are doing, because it is my interest. Um, and it, that is, but it's sort of swept up in this like, huge wave of images that's constantly crashing on the beach that I'm like pulling from. Yes. Does that go anywhere near the answer? It's, that was beautiful. I, I mean, like, forget my questions. I mean, just to kind of go along with what you're saying, I feel like, uh, well, m my practice, I, I make these kind of sculptural arrangements and then I photograph it. Um, and it's really the, the image of that sculptural arrangement that I respond to to make my next decisions. Yeah. Um, Oftentimes, I feel like my practice is actually almost backwards from you, where it's <laughs> quick making with physical objects, and then, I mean, I think maybe I'm just really slow at Photoshop or something, but like that, that that's the really kind of slow and arduous element. But um, so just kind of working quickly and then just responding um, to the image itself and almost barely looking at the, um, the physical objects in front of me um, and just kind of a personal thing, I feel like I, you know, when I try on a shirt, I have to, even though there's a mirror there, I have to take a photograph of the mirror in order for, um, for me to kind of understand what it actually yeah. looks like. There's something that I think happens a lot um, just in terms of that. In that photographic space, yeah. That's, yeah. There's a lot happening there. Um, I would say that I'm almost like egregiously bad at contextualizing myself in, in the like larger art context. It's like, but the, because I'm, because I started out that way of sort of like, for lack of a better word, defacing other people's images, it yeah. felt very, um, you know, uh, self-contained in that way. And, and uh, so sometimes I can go a really long time without thinking about lo like, you know, contextualizing the work within larger art context or, um, you know, looking at other people's work so much, except for these guys, <laughs> it's like, because it's, a, it's a, the kind of conversation I'm used to. But, um, but uh, yeah, for me, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in the, the, the way that people use these tools. So I'm always trying to contextualize myself within like a relation to a user of any of, you know, whether it's like a cell phone camera or, or you know, sort of an amateur Photoshop experience or, uh, you know, downloading image editing software and just kind of clunking around with it. Yeah. We're going to come back to that point. John's going to... Yeah, I was going to say the idea of a body of work is something that is actually a very photographic idea right. as well. And that's sort of how I organize my, my thoughts or, or my practice, you know, with, I think, before, like Walker Evans, nobody talked about a body of work. This was a, a kind of term that's, that's now used very widely, of course, but really is a, is a photographic idea and one that I think, you know, in, in my aggregate series, I sort of, you know, took my experience as a software engineer and paired that with the kind of photographic ground. And it was an attempt to find what is the materiality of photography now that it's backed by a kind of digital language. And that was the search in that body of work. And then, yeah. uh, 
you know, I sort of went for a car ride with psychoanalysis and photography <laughs> again, and we all got in this minivan and cruised around, and uh, that, that became the next body of work, a historiograph paper. So I, I, I find that, like, the kind of organizing principle for me is a body of work that involves photography as a kind of ground, and then, and then some interest that happens to be um, a bit outside of that or beside that at, at the time, and, yeah. then, and then how those things fit together and how I can work through it photographically it has become the way that I, that I work. Yeah. That's a revelation to me, the idea of photography as an organizing principle, more than a set of acts. That's great. Um, Kate, you were just, you were talking about your kind of user or the sort of user mentality having a, a lot to do with the context when you're, you're working. And um, it's sort of, uh, I feel like I need to declare about photography as magic because it's so much about this idea of relationship with viewer or mm -hmm. user. And so the Photography is Magic comes out, I mean, the, the starting point of that for me was 2007, going to the Magic Castle, which is the Magician's Club in Los Angeles, and really getting into close-up magic. So I think the title's great, and maybe I would have given the book that title anyway because it's so optimistic, but it's literally, for me, embedded in the practices of magic, of mm -hmm. close-up magic. And um, a close-up magician, when they're going through their practice, which is where you prompted, you reminded me, does so with a three-faceted mirror. So it's all about the perspective of the viewer rather than from their own perspective. And with the full cognizance that a magic trick doesn't, it, it happens in the imagination of the viewer. Like it has a certain mechanics, often ones with enormous amount of seeming repetition and iteration that goes on. But actually that, that's the, the magic is not in the mechanics, the magic is in what it triggers in the imagination. And so then, then I got into this idea of the sort of sleight of hand mm -hmm. that's going on within practices. That, you know, that they, these, your kind of practices are not making, they're not relying on those traditional things that got contemporary art photography established, like a signature style or a very definite subject. So these very concretized ideas of what a photograph needed to be to function as contemporary art. And also this kind of massive separation between viewer and artist. So using different cameras from, from everyone else, from your viewer very different production values. And so, and I see within the work, the work that you guys are doing is not only that sort of recognition of our general visual literacy, so using not only your expertise, but also what everyone's doing and what you know all of the readers and viewers of your work already do. Um, but also, I think, sort of playing with technologies and renderings, which might clearly have begun their processes within the commercial world, so somewhere other than art, which is a really interesting chapter within photography as contemporary art, because if you think about back to the sort of 70s, and you know, as contemporary art gets established in the 90s, it was almost like a sort of school and state rule of, of technologies, that artists used the large format cameras, the sort of historic cameras and it had no con connection really with what was happening in the commercial professional worlds of photography and you're working in a moment where essentially it's the same technologists as a c as commercial practice and it's the same mentality as everyone looking at your work so I, I wonder if you could elaborate more in terms of you know, do you imagine who your viewers are, or do you, um, and uh, clearly you anticipate how the works are going to be read within this current image environment? You can contradict me and say, no, actually, I'm no different from a cubist, but, <laughs> but I'd love to hear about what you think about the reading and the viewing of your work. Well, it's a, I think I, def I definitely um, am looking to reach the person that digests, you know, these kind of images which we all do, you know, stock images and advertising images yeah. um, on the on a daily basis. Which is why I choose them because I that because of that resonance with the larger uh, cultural context rather than just a purely art context. And I think you see this like I, I definitely consider the practice like jumping off from people like Heineken and um, you know uh, sort Heineken, of integra yeah. integrating yeah. those kind of aesthetics and juxtapositions and re rearranging rearranging them so they have. You know, a, a, like a different syntax potentially. You know, but but keeping those those signifiers in place um, because they're so powerful outside of 
um, the traditional art context is, is kind of how I think about it. Yeah. I, I, you, I typically draw from, I work in appropriation and I'm drawing from like mass produced, published things that you know, were mostly delivered to people's homes in the 70s and 60s. And so um, yeah. I think that it's, I, I was interested in revisiting it because I learned photography in that manner. And I, there were certain things now having worked as an academic teaching photography for so many years, there were certain things that I felt like were really key to include in a photograph for a certain kind of academic audience or art historical audience. And then I was very surprised to find some things, like some people that fall through the cracks and didn't get you know, put into the canon proper. And, it, and, and I try to be responsible about finding a mix between all of these different things. Right. Because I think that generationally, there's also gonna be a, a different sort of read for like a very young person who might know a famous historical image, but might not know what's next to it, but know something like it that will be a reference to them. Um, or somebody who actually lived through a particular historic event because it, does, it draws from photojournalism, like through many different kinds of photography, yeah. art photography, all these different distinctions that we make up. Yeah. But um, so I, I definitely, my relationship is always personal with the image as I'm looking through it and I'm cutting out the spaces that I'm interested in building a composition that's actually more formal than anything else just to, to make a picture work, I think work, and then setting it out to see what people, how people relate to it. Um, and, and I think it's interesting that people want sort of validation about that they, that they know what they're looking at. And they can, but it also serves as, all of the different cutouts serves as different prompts that yes. will spin conversations off in many different directions. And that's fun just to overhear people talking about the pictures for me. Yeah. And also, and also kind of using photography not only as a material, but also as this prompt for something else to happen. Oh, I mean, yeah. the, the, you know, the quickest route to you delivering that is to scalpel out and, and put up the, the icon itself, this ideogram of something, and then it prompts something in our imaginations. Right. Yeah, I, mean, I feel like my work, um, I mean, just the way that images move throughout the world, um, you know, you make work and then you, you just kind of you put it out there in a certain way, and then it, it feels like you just kind of talking to nobody in particular in a, in a certain way. Um, but there's, it a there's a danger that feels like pure silence and tumbleweed, though, yeah. isn't there? If you're not kind of at least imagining who you're talking to. Yeah, but then you know, <laughs> knowing that my work um, is influenced by certain things, and I'm trying to have a dialogue with um, other individuals, and and that there is this conversation that happens. Um, mm whether or not it's explicit, whether it's actually, you know, talking or texting or, or meeting in person, but just how people, I think, immediately respond to images and how that kind of plays into yeah. um, how they think about images or how they uh, make their own images. I mean, that relates very much to this idea of close-up magic, which is it's a very close circle of viewership as well. And I think that, I mean, when, when you finally get a chance to really look at photography as magic, there will be people who you have, have had these long-term conversations with, literally. You've had this kind of abstract, others that you've had these abstract conversations, sort of almost like, well, what does that mean in relation to Lucas Blaylock or, or, or whoever? And then other people who maybe you, you, you weren't aware of, but actually is like the sort of third circle in, in the magic parlor, really, who are thinking the same things. Yeah, I, I, following on that, that, that idea of a, of a circle, a kind of social relation, I, I, you know, that's been the greatest gift, I think, of, of having a career is, is the number of studio visits I now have. You know, yes. it's like five, five a week at least. There are people coming through. Amazing. And the relationality of that and the way in which I can, I don't have to necessarily think about a viewer because I'm having a conversation as I'm making my work continually at, yeah. at, at a, every point. And that's, again, you know, just really been the best, the best part about all of, all of this, in a sense. Um, but I, you know, I do think about attention uh, and not, not, not getting somebody's attention, not as like, a, say, a marketer would, uh, not hooking somebody, but more like what, what happens when somebody engages with my work and how do I keep or encourage a kind of attention that is outside of the everyday attention that we kind of live through in our day-to-day -day experience, which, which, you know, of course, tends to be quite fragmented and, and quick. And so I, I've done this in, in a few ways, but recently it's, it's really been about creating a kind of strange, distantiated uh, spatialness within the photographs 
that's not apparent as to how it was constructed. So there's a kind yes. of working through visually on the part of the viewer that encourages a kind of focus and attention that uh, hopefully is, is, is I'm, I get very moralistic about this, but it's hopefully outside of the kind of everyday experience. That, yeah. That's something that's very important to me. And, and of course you can't, it's a difficult thing to will. Uh, you have yes. to kind of set up the, the kind of uh, environment for that and hope it occurs. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Which is also, I mean, you're also reminding me of this idea of sleight of hand, really. And um, to a certain degree, the sort of misdirection of attention that goes on in magic, that one thing might uh, ostensibly propose itself as one thing, but actually be triggering other things. And that being very much part of the ways that your process is of kind of getting attention and sustaining attention in, in the work, right? Completely, it reminds me of like emotion and strong emotion and how often we're moved by things that we, we don't expect at all, like the way the light suddenly hits something and you're just mm. yeah. moved beyond sort of language, you know? And, and that, that kind of feeling, I think, is... Um, ag again, I, I think that's the greatest thing I've learned from, from going through psychoanalysis is that you can't... Uh, sort of have a goal of having that experience, it has to just happen. And, 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 but, but how do you set up your world, in a sense, so that it can happen, so that you can yes. sort of foster, foster that? Yeah. I think that that um, experience and that circumstance is a really good way to end um, and open it up to question and answer. So we do have a microphone for anybody who has a question. Or an observation. Or an observation. Yeah. <laughs> Anything at all. Okay, well, if there's no questions, um, please join us in thanking our panelists. Um, oh. And the oh. oh, we do. <laughs> we do have a question. Oh. I don't know how much you'll like this question, but <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm a photographer, I too. think it's great that you're asking it. Thank you. <laughs> I, I'm a little bit baffled by appropriation art. Um, for example, recently Richard Prince had uh, photographed Instagram or appropriated Instagram images and they added a comment and, and blew them up, enlarged the print, and is selling them as his own in New York um, for, I, I hear, $90,000. And the original, I, this is what I read, the original person who, one of the, at least one of them, who made the art was selling them for $90 as, <laughs> for, as a spiteful thing, I guess. And I, I'm curious, do you have any um, qualms about appropriating other people's images? And also, is there a legal aspect to this that is involved. I'll speak to that. Um, from my, I, I buy other people's images as stock, so there's like an exchange there, which is, a, you know, to me, I feel like an extension of that um, collaboration, <laughs> you know. Um, but then again, I'm not opposed to uh, to grabbing from the web either, just because it's, you know, once I feel like the, in my work, it's so altered that that. They become someone else's. They become something else in the process of, of that alteration. I mean, I think it's definitely a, a, a continuum between, you know, say, Richard Prince and and then you know, something that becomes entirely other in the process of its its um, you know sort of interventions along the way. Yeah, um, yeah and I just feel like um, at this point we kind of live in this remix culture, and we have for kind of a long time. I mean. That's uh, maybe a um, more glaring example, um, but I think that yeah. generally, and uh, all of our practices f um, are, are not doing the same kind of thing as that, and I think that it's about kind of garnering influences and kind of um, folding them into what we're doing. I don't know, it, it's, it, feels, it, feels, it, um, it feels different. It is different. Um, I, I think that was. I think it's a really bad art project, that Prince project, mm -hmm. and um, and I, I mean I, I think it sort of clusters lots of interesting discussion around it. But I think it's massively unconvincing as 
either a, a piece of work that sort of shows best practice within appropriation and where that could go within Web 2.0 era, because it's a historic idea, appropriation. I, um, one, of the, one of the kind of sections of contemporary art photography, which is not in photography is magic, is where I see photographers who make pictures for museums and collections treating social media and Web 2.0 as a subject. So it's almost like another genre, like still life, landscape, documentary, and the internet. And you know, you got, and it, one of my problems with that is, is it's, just, it's just illustration. It just means that you know, a curator in a collection in the Midwest, a photo collection in the mi Midwest goes, oh, how convenient, I can, I can address the, internet, the image environment by buying this body of work, which doesn't operate in any way differently from something produced 30 years ago. So it sort of illustrates a moment rather than being embedded within it, which definitely what I see the artists such as these doing. One moment. You just mentioned something about best practices in terms of appropriation. I mean, is there, you know, whether it's a personal set or a, a broader set of like, of, I don't know, guidelines or rules or, no, or you know, marcation I, I of, of... I wouldn't dare. <laughs> there, there's no way that you could, you know, like, like I, I, you know, it's, it's like pornography, you know, when you see it. Like, right. is there, <laughs> is there anything, I mean, it's, is it that simple? There's no... Well, I mean, I think these. I think what's going on here is not really strictly appropriation. It's not quite the right word because that's a historic term. I mean, where I do where I do see that sort of modality going on in contemporary practice is when a photograph is used as an ideogram. It sort of stands in for something. So, I mean, for me, one of the sort of precursors to photography is magic is the practice of Rachel Harrison, who might who has in the past embedded photographs within sculptures. And there's something really beautifully direct and blunt, very appropriative about that gesture, where it's not about, you know, it's not about authorship of the image itself, but it's like this this image will prompt what the artist wants it to prompt, wants you to be prompted in you. I mean, I guess in a way very much like you, right? Right. I, I, um, there's not like a, a, a mathematical equation to whether or not you're, you would be at risk for being sued for something or not. Anybody can sue anybody they wants to, <laughs> unfortunately. But I have had meetings with people. Um, I think the College, uh, the College Art Association, CAA's website, does have some references about um, best practices. A meeting with an art lawyer is a great idea. Um, I think that you know when I draw another imagery, it is usually very specific to that image for the purpose to illustrate something around that person's practice or that idea. Um, so it's done with intention. It is done um, with homage or like uh, I mean uh, an honest reference to. I, so I, I think when looking at my work, there's never any. You would never suspect that I'm claiming that ownership of this image or that I took that image. It, usually there are like sort of quote marks, invisible quote marks around that <laughs> as a reference towards a larger idea. Um, so, but there's definitely, there's sources online and I, I also would not hazard to guess what Richard Prince is thinking with that work, so. <laughs> Hi, um, I was wondering if you could maybe talk about in your practices how you think about the distance between, in a photograph, the image and the object, because I feel, feel it's a medium that nice those question. things are forgotten <laughs> frequently. Um, so, yeah, please. Hi, Simon. Hey. Um, I think that's a great question, and I feel like that happens a lot with, with my work. Uh, my mom's here, and um, for a really long time, she had never seen my work in person and only seen it through, uh, through my website or through things I had emailed or texted her. and. Um, she was like, I don't, I don't really get what you're doing. Uh, like, <laughs> um, and then she was able to see the work in person and it shifted because they are kind of dimensional, there's a play with the surface, um, there are collage elements that don't get read in the, um, the flat plane. I think when you are experiencing images or, or work on the same screen that you check email, that you, um, you know, go on Facebook on, it's, it's it's, it has this weird leveling out that um, is, is different than when 
the physical objects is, is presented in front of you and you can move around it. And, yeah, yeah for, for me, the, the idea of image and object, uh, I think the, the thing that I learned in architecture school that may have been the most valuable was we would often build uh, models with, with uh, cardboard and hot glue. And the fascinating thing about it was that if you photographed this dimensional thing, this object, you could actually make it more of a space through its depiction than the actual object itself. And so this, this power of photography to, to take something that we normally wouldn't look at and make us look at it, it, it that seed was sort of planted for me in architecture school. and. Uh, just this idea that something could be made more spatial by making it flat and making it a depiction, it, it seems very counterintuitive, but uh, the collapsing of the object is, is something I think that in architecture school ultimately led to the way that I make the, the historiograph paper works. Right. Yeah. Okay, do you have anything to say? About, it's a big subject, the it's image object. You well, know. It's, it's, it's funny, I, I was, I'm, I'm thinking that the, you, know, the, you guys both put it so well, um, because it is that, that mechanism of, of photographing something and viewing it through uh, that, that surface that uh, is, is something that's so vital to our experience. Um, yeah, I mean, in my work, it's, it's tricky because they go from, from image-based collages to then a mock-up that I, you know, with, with all the appropriate measurements and stuff that I send to a framer and then um, to an object. And sometimes I can't even look at my own work or understand how it's performing until I photograph it again, in, you know, in situ. And then, um, so, so yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a vacillating back and forth between yes. the physical and the photographic plane, even though at this point my practice is, is highly physical. Yes. Um, and less, less um, you know, well, I'm thinking in particular, like the in some of your work, you incorporate mass-produced things mm -hmm. um, or industrial things mm -hmm. like chains, etc., or wheels, yeah. or and and so there's there's this kind of there is this very direct interplay between yeah. what how you're using photography and the image and mm -hmm. how you're using you know pre-existing manufactured materials. Yeah, well, I think that you know the the manufactured materials, like re to me, they resonate on a similar level because they're yeah. also, also you know a lot of us ex our experience of shopping or you know is, is is the same as our experience of image gathering. They're all they're all screen based until they come to you and then they they <laughs> physicalize in this way. So those those gestures are really about making a uh, you know a an equation between those two. Uh, things, the image and the, the, the thing that then comes and is, you know, placed alongside or on top of or underneath the, the work. But, uh, and, and in other ways, they're just ways of sort of pointing, pointing the viewer or whoever's experiencing the work to a physical, you know, wheels as like a, a gesture you know, implying speed or implying mobility or, you know, yeah. um, and, and, you know, forcing them to behave in the same way as, as, as the images. Yes. And that brings us to time. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Um, can I also say, um, you can see uh, some more of Kate's work at Higher Pictures in the Exposure section, booth 717. And we're all heading down to the Aperture Foundation display space, which is on the left-hand side. And if you want to continue the conversation and look at our beautiful book, you'd be more than welcome. And Charlotte will be signing copies, so get one. Oh,